Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Solar Rotor Ultracentrifugation, an effective tool for nanoparticle separations at large scale. My name is Markus Knus and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Kruger Life Sciences. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the speaker and not of Beckman Kruger Life Sciences. For more information on Beckman Kruger, please visit beckman.com slash resources. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. You can also see at the top of the page multiple tabs. Please click through our related applications, upcoming and on-demand webinars, as well as links to the Cell Culture Heroes webpage. You may be our next Cell Culture Hero. Also, please notice you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab and found that is found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located at the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce the presenters, Dr. Alexander Wittemann, Professor of Colloid Chemistry, and Dr. Simone Plüsch, Senior Researcher of Colloid Chemistry, both at the University of Konstanz, Germany. This is a special honor for me since I have done my studies there as well. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of the screen. Dr. Wittemann, Dr. Plüsch, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mr. Knust. So in the following minutes, we would like to discuss with you sorting of nanoparticles as scales ranging from small scales uh, up to large scales by centrifugal techniques that allow for proper fractionations. Well, why is sorting of nanoparticles such an important issue in modern nanoscience? Well, the properties of nanoparticles strongly depend on parameters such as size, shape, and composition. So as an example here, we see gold nanorods of varying aspect ratio. Now the aspect ratio is defined as the length to width ratio. And following the aspect ratio, size and shape of the particles will change. And you see this has a drastic impact on the optical and plasmonic properties of these nanoparticles. In the lower row, we have a second example. So here we have Corchell particles. So these are silica spheres coating with a thin gold layer of varying density. So following the density of the shell, also the composition of these Corchell particles will change. And again, this has a drastic impact on the properties of the particles. So if you rely on a synthesis protocol that gives you um, particles that vary in their size, density, or composition, so which you refer to as polydispersity, then you should think about fractionation, which will bring you in the position to precisely determine the properties of your nanoparticles. Moreover, having access to uniform particles is also key towards assembling nanoparticles into hierarchically organized superstructures. So as an example here, you see uniform gold nanoparticles with a cubic shape who are aligned into crystalline superstructures. Now, before we will come back to science, let me briefly introduce you where we are from. So we are now working since almost nine years with University of Constance. So Constance is located in the very south of Germany and the old town of Constance directly borders on Switzerland. And the town gave its name to the Lake Constance, which is surrounded by three countries, Germany, Switzerland and Austria. Now our campus is located on a headland which subdivides Lake Constance into Lake Überlingen, which is a famous sailing resort, and the so-called Untersee, uh, which was 
And there's the Isle of uh, Reichenau, which was a monastery island during medieval ages. Okay, the University of Constance, and you can see here our campus on the lower left, was founded in 1966. So it's one of Germany's youngest universities, and it's also one of Germany's universities of excellence. Now, our neighbor is the Isle of Mainau, which you might know. So this is a flower island which attracts about one and a half millions of visitors each year. So in spring, you could see here millions of beautiful tulips. Now, as I told you, Austria, Switzerland, and even Bavaria are actually very close. So there you have nice opportunities for hiking and you can enjoy such a marvelous lake and mountain views. Now, let's come back to science. Why are we interested in sorting of nanoparticles? Well, our research activities are centered around supracolloidal assembly, which means that we would like to take nanoparticles, let's say as a sort of colloidal Lego bricks, and then our aim is to assemble them into more complex structure. So this starts with clusters of a limited number of particles, which are often referred to as colloidal molecules as they share configurations with true molecules. So as a, a, an example here, you see dimers, which you can consider as colloidal oxygen molecules, or heterodimers, which you can uh, consider as colloidal hydrogen fluoride molecules. Now, these colloidal molecules take on a key role in supracolloidal assembly, as they can have the potential to bridge the gap between the single particles at a nanoscale and such highly complex materials. So this is actually a colloidal tetra stack, so an assembly of tetrahedral shaped particles. And this is material is often considered as the holy grail of a photonic material, as it provides large and robust optical uh, band gaps along the whole range of visible light. And this comes along with uh, birefringence and low refractive index contrast. However, in order to get access to such uh, dream materials, much more has to be done to make colloidal molecules available at large scales. And this is where sorting is an issue, as you will see in a minute. Now, having access to reasonable amount of colloidal molecules should bring us in the position to start developing strategies that allow precise assembly into the target superstructure, which we are aiming at. So now the colloidal molecules, which we would like to discuss with you today, are assembly of these uniform polystyrene particles, which you see on, on the left side. So they are highly uniform and can be prepared at large scales. So here sorting is not yet an issue. Now these particles have dimensions in the order of 100 nanometers, which mean that these particles and small clusters build their off under light Brownian motion, which prevails over sedimentation. Now, how to make these colloidal molecules? Well, we basically mix oil and water, and we add the particles to be assembled into clusters to one of the two fluid phases. Actually, it doesn't matter to which one, because after emulsification, which is performed by powerful ultrasound, they will be trapped to the surface of the emulsion droplets in either case. Now, the ultrasound helps us to control the size and the dispersity of the emulsion droplets. So if we have a closer look on such an emulsion droplet, we can see that indeed the particles are trapped at the surface of the emulsion droplet. And this is mediated uh, by minimization of surface energy. So the phenomenon is referred to as the Pickering effect. Now, the emulsion droplets uh, serves as a template and for the assembly into clusters. And if we now evaporate the dispersed droplets phase, then we create strong capillary forces, which make the particles come together and assemble into clusters of well-defined geometries. So here you have now an overview of the uh, reaction results. So we get a mixture starting from single particles, 
particle dimers, trimers, tetramers, pentamers, and hexamers. Now, the fact that we get a mixture of uh, various species is a direct outcome of the random distribution of the particles on the emulsion droplets. So hence, sorting is an issue, and this is where centrifugation enters the scene. So now let's start with some basic consideration. Now, if exposed to a centrifugal field, particle sediment at a rate which is defined by the sedimentation coefficient. Now, the sedimentation coefficient is defined as the ratio of the effective mass of the particles and its friction coefficient. The latter depends also on the particle shape. Now, the effective mass of the particle um, is the difference between the actual mass of the particles and the mass of the fluid which is displaced by the particles. Now, for spherical particles, we can express the equation, so the sedimentation coefficient, as a function of two important parameters. So the first one is particle size, defined as the particle radius or the hydrodynamic effective radius of the particles. And the second one is the particle density, which we refer to as buoyant density of the particle. So the sedimentation coefficient depends on these two important parameters. Moreover, if you look at the equation in the blue box, the value in the bracket will become zero if you create a density environment for the sedimentating particle where the density of the fluid layer matches exactly the one of the particle. And so at this point, sedimentation will come to a full stop and we can make use of this by bending particles according to their buoyant density, as you will see in a second. Now, still nowadays, the most common technique of centrifugation is called differential centrifugation. Maybe all of you will be familiar with this technique. This is exactly where you form a pallet of agglomerated particle at the bottom of your centrifuge tube. Now, differential centrifugation starts with having homogeneous distribution of the various particle population within a centrifuge tube. And after centrifugation, even some of the smallest and lightest particles will end up in the pellet because some of them are initially located close to the bottom of the centrifuge tube. So in other words, there's only a portion of the smallest and lightest particles which you can be uh, which can be recovered in pure form now differential centrifugation works out reasonably well if the sedimentation coefficient of the particle populations to be separated from one another differ by at least one order in magnitude well way better separations can be achieved by using density gradient centrifugation and there are actually two different directions how to perform density gradient centrifugation. The first one is termed isopeisnic separation. The method is also known as buoyant density separation because here you classify the particles according to their buoyant density. On the right hand side, we see an example from the very early days of this technique where Kehler and Lloyd use polystyrene latex particle for precisely determining the density of polystyrene. Now the polystyrene latex is loaded on top of a sucrose density gradient and now the particles will travel down their way through the gradient until they reach a position, the so-called isopeisnic point, where the density of the fluid exactly matches the buoyant density of the particle. So this is where, if you remember, this is where sedimentation comes to a full stop and we can now bend the particle according to their density. And this provides really excellent resolutions. So here you have to build density gradients, which at their lower end um, have lower densities than the actual density of the particles, whereas at the heaviest end of the density gradient, the density exceeds the buoyant density of the particle. 
So this is an equilibrium technique. And so you get bending in discrete zones according to the buoyant density of the particles. Now there's one isopisic separation which actually became famous. So today it's often referred to as the most beautiful experiment in biology. Now this experiment was designed by Messelson and Stahl in the late 1950s. So at that time, the double helix nature of DNA was just discovered. And there was a debate among the three different mechanisms of DNA replication. Now, Messelson and Stahl could solve this issue by designing an elegant approach, which starts with, uh, they let DNA grow in a nitrogen-15 uh, culture medium, which results in DNA, which has a higher buoyant density than regular DNA formed in an N14 culture medium. Then they let a first replication of the DNA molecule proceed. And this experiment is then carried out now in an N14 culture medium. Then they centrifuge the, the reaction product in a cesium chloride density gradient, allowing for isopisonic bending of DNA. Now, the debate was among three different mechanisms. The first one is called semi-conservative replication mechanism, and it was proposed by Watson and Crick. So here, the double-stranded molecule is divided first into two parental strengths, which serve as template for the construction of new complementary daughter strands. Other scientists believed that bonding of the double helix is too strong to allow for a first division. So they thought that the newly formed DNA must be a full copy of the double-stranded, of the original double-stranded molecule. In the third mechanism, segments of newly formed DNA together with segments um, of uh, parental DNA will enter into the newly formed DNA double strands. And now we can classify the potential reaction products according to their weight. And for the conservative replication mechanism, we would expect a population of heavy DNA together with an population of lighter DNA. Whereas for the other two mechanisms, we would expect reaction products of medium density. Now, in terms of isopisonic centrifugation, this would refer either to having two different density populations or having just a single density population. And now Messelson and Stahl found in their experiment a single band of DNA Thus, they could rule out the conservative replication mechanism. But there are still two options. So Messelson and Stahl solved this by doing a second DNA replication, again in an N14 culture medium. And so they predicted the potential reaction outcome. And here you see an overview for the two remaining mechanisms. And again, we can now classify the potential reaction products according to their density. So we have now two populations for in the semi-conservative replication mechanism, whereas there's a single reaction product expected for the dispersed replication. So now in terms of isopisonic separation, this is two bands versus a single band. And yeah, Messelson and Stahl finally uh, they could detect two different populations of DNA, thus they could verify the semi-conservative replication mechanism that was proposed by Watson and Crick. So now let's discuss about the second way to perform density gradient centrifugation. So this is alternative to classifying nanoparticle populations according to their density. So here, the particle populations travel down the density gradient at a rate which is at different rates which are specified by their different sedimentation coefficients. And here we thus classify the particles according to their sedimentation coefficient. Now this technique was pioneered 
also in 1951 by Myron Brake, who used this uh, technique for the purification of plant viruses. And here, the important prerequisite is that the density of the particles must be always uh, higher than the highest density within the gradient. On the other hand, the sample density, which means particles plus dispersant, should have a lower density than the lowest density within the gradient. So this is the prerequisite to make the particles settle into vitrally at the rate exactly defined by their sedimentation coefficient. And of course, you have to stop such an experiment before equilibration, otherwise you would end up in a pellet. Now I would like to hand over to my colleague Simone Blüsch. She has long-term experience in carrying out uh, centrifugations and she will let you know about the experimental realization. So thanks Alexander and welcome from the lab. So the whole story starts with constructing a density gradient. So we need a gradient in a centrifuge tube. There are several ways, but the most widely used method is an overlayering method. So we start with the dense solution and then we layer successively lower densities on the top from a pipette. So we end up with a discontinuous gradient with a total volume of 35 milliliters. We can receive a continuous gradient, eventually a linear gradient, by allowing the gradient to diffuse, but this procedure takes quite a long time. So uh, we are using this method only if our low, uh, of if our solution, the bottom is really high concentrated and therefore extremely viscous. So in our case, 55 weight percent. And um, so loading the sample works in exactly the same way. Um, we recommend again using a pipette because the pressure is easy to control and therefore the flow of the sample on the top of the gradient. So it takes a little bit of practice. And uh, the traditional way of constructing a continuous gradient is to use a two-chamber gradient maker. Here a simple model with two identical chambers connected by a tapped channel. And the mixing chamber has an outlet. So the device is set up with the mixing chamber on a magnetic stereo with the outlet tube leading via the peristaltic pump to the bottom of a centrifuge tube. So how does it work? So the high density solution is filled in the left chamber and the low density solution is filled in the mixing chamber. And then um, we switch on the pump, we switch on the magnetic steerer and we open the connecting taps. So first one, uh, one between the two chambers and then the one who is located next to the peristaltic pump. So a few experimental insights. So it's really important that there are no air bubbles in the connection tube. So for this, we fill first uh, the mixing chamber with the low density solution, open the tap, let the uh, solution flow until the end of the channel, close the tap again, and then we fill inside the high density solution. So it's also important that in both chambers are steer bars, and uh, this ensures the same height of the density solutions in these chambers. And at the end, it's also really important uh, to regulate the power of the steer bar. Um, to avoid air bubbles and to avoid an early cut of the flow in the direction of the peristaltic pump. So such a scheme often looks more than it is. So here this is our setup. On the left side, we have the gradient maker and the magnetic steerer in the middle, the peristaltic pump, and on the right side, a particular tube. So for rate zone separation, a thin walled ultra clear tube is recommended. By ultra clear, okay, you want to see your bands and you also want to see um, low concentrated bands and thin walled because um, 
you want to have a few options when it comes to isolating particular bands. Um, but I want to talk about this in a few slides. Now we have um, the density gradient with the sample on the top. And what about the rotor? So there are um, several different rotors available. For instance, the fixed angle rotor, um, the vertical rotor, and the swinging bucket rotor. So the two most uh, commonly used rotors are the fixed angle and the swinging bucket rotor. Um, the selection of a rotor depends on sample volume, number of sample particles to be separated, the particle size and or the density, desired runtime and desired quality of separation. And for the rate zone density gradient method in which the maximum resolution of sample components is needed, excellent separation can be achieved if we are using swing and out rotors. Because of the length of the tubes in the horizontal position, the sample separation runtimes are very long due to the um, increased distance, the particles will travel for, um, for effective separation. And um, sorry. And additionally, the separated zones remain at the same position in the tube during and after centrifugation. And this contributes to an excellent sorting efficiency. So we optimize the strategy for sorting colloidal molecules. So uh, here you see a centrifuge tube with banded colloidal molecules. They're all well banded into discrete bands. And here we probe different sets of irex experimental parameters. And we also applied different extraction strategies. For instance, we can um, use a cannula and collect the particles from above. And it also works well, well if we inject a needle from the side so we can selectively extract a specific band. We can also use a piercing unit and discharge the fractions from below. But uh, sometimes you want to have a 100% clear fraction. And if you use, for example, a cannula and go through a band, it can happen that you sweep particles from a higher located band um, away and it can be that you contaminate uh, the desired band. So it's sometimes better to use first a uh, tube slicer. So you have the tube, you push a knife through the tube, you collect the fluid from the top, um, remove the, sli the knife and then you uh, use again your cannula and collect the desired band. So here you can see some fraction of our colloidal molecules we got. So we have pure monomers, pure dimers, trimers, tetramers, pentamers, and hexamers. So this is a visual impression from scanning electron micrographs. So let's combine them with quantitative data. So we here we have the particle size distribution of all our six fractions of colloidal molecules and they are basically free of any foreign species. So now separation using the swinging rotor allows for, separate, for separation of about 20 milligrams of colloidal molecules. So this is sufficient for analytical purposes and indeed we could use these particles to probe hydrodynamic properties of complex of of complex particles such as diffusion coefficient. But as shown in the beginning, we are really interested to build sub superstructures and therefore our wish is to have one gram of colloidal molecules or better two grams. So, um, so how about large scales, Alexander? Thank you, Simona, for sharing these important experimental details and letting us know about small-scale separations. The question that you ask uh, is, 
how to do large scale. And there a method came to our attention that was established already in the 1960s by Norman G. Anderson at Oak Ridge for biological separations. So this method was even used for the commercial purification of influenza vaccines. But to our great surprise, it had never been used uh, for sorting of synthetic particles, and we are actually the first ones doing so. So now this method has two major characteristics. The first one is that you have a bowl-shaped hollow rotor, which replaces the need of having any centrifuge tubes. So this hollow bowl-shaped rotor hosts large volumes of density gradients. And the second important characteristic is that this rotor can be loaded and unloaded dynamically. This means that we can load the gradient and then the sample, and later we can harvest the zones of banded particle while the rotor is spinning. And this avoids any reorientation of fluid layer during the full operation and contributes to an excellent sorting efficiency. Now, here you see a top view of a zonal rotor on the right-hand side with an inner core. Now, this uh, core with four vertical scepter allows for a compartmentalization of the rotor chamber and thus helps to minimize Edward's flow of fluid. Moreover, it contains channels that allow to selectively address a rotor sender and rotor edge. And this is the prerequisite for dynamic loading. Now, if you compare now a centrifuge tube in a swing out rotor with a sonal rotor, then you can consider the sonal rotor as an extension of the centrifuge tube by 360 degree. Now there's still an important difference you should be aware of because the profile of the density gradient is very crucial to, to get proper separations. So for instance, if we build a density gradient, which is linear in volume, it will be also linear in radius if placed in a, a centrifuge tube. However, because of the bowl-shaped geometry of the sonal rotor, it will correspond to a concave profile in radius if uh, put in a sonal rotor. Okay, so now let's explain you how dynamic loading is performed. So we start with spinning the rotor at a reduced rate of let's say 2000 RPM. And then we start with pumping in the lightest part of the gradient to be built within the rotor chamber. And this portion of fluid is pumped towards the edge of the rotor. Now this fluid layer will be then displaced by layers of next higher densities until the gradient is fully loaded. Now, once the gradient is fully loaded, then we can start with loading the sample, which is introduced via the center line. So this is shown in subfigure B. Then we remove the two-way fluid seal that allowed for dynamic loading. And now we accelerate the rotor to the speed, which is actually required for proper sorting of the nanoparticles. So once the nanoparticles are probably bended into discrete zones, of the very different, uh, for the very different particle populations, then we can again decelerate the rotor to a reduced rate of 2000 RPM. Then we will again mount the two way fluid seal. And now we can harvest the zone of banded particles by pumping in a very dense solution of gradient material towards the rotor edge, thus displacing the zone of. Uh, of banded particles via the sender line. Now again, my colleague uh, Simone will explain you about the experimental realization. So this is a view of our lab when we started with zonal rotor centrifugation. Here you can see the most simple setup where you are able to carry out a zonal run. So we just need several graduated beakers for the gradient preparation and a peristaltic pump for the loading and deloading process and of course the zonal rotor and the core which is placed in the rotor bowl. So 
At the moment, we are working on further optimization of this technique. So here we have an online spectrometer that is communicating with an adapted software, specific belts and a fraction collector. And this should in the future allow us to make the system automatically decide if a fraction is worth to be collected or not. So back to our colloidal clusters. So after zonal rotor centrifugation, we can use this fraction collector to collect all the zones. Now in a typical experiment, we collect more than 80 fractions, 20 milliliters each, and then we do a careful analysis of all these fractions. So we measure the absorption, absorb, absorption profile that you can see at the top, and we also measure the density of all these fractions to probe the density gradient profile. And we also measure the particle size distribution of every fraction to precisely know the composition of all these fractions. So let's have a closer look into this. We are building a step gradient in this example. However, the density steps will even out during centrifugation. And so the profile will convert into a continuous one. And here um, and here we are using a convex gradient because the shape of this gradient profile is believed to provide particular good separations. Now we can overlay the density gradient profile and the absorption pattern, and so we can now map the zones of banded particles. Here we have the monomers, the dimers, trimers, and tetramers, and all larger species are accumulated near the rotor wall because we are mainly interested in having larger yields of dimers and trimers in this case. Okay, since we know the composition of all the fractions, we can also experimentally deconvolute this absorption pattern into contributions of single particle populations as you can see here. So, Together with this, we can set up a full separation map, which you can see on the left. And we can also optimize the gradient profile for different sets of particles. Well, um, I should mention that at the moment, we can achieve to get more than 600 milligrams of colloidal molecules sorted. However, the actual bottleneck is here, not the zonal rotor, um, which uh, would allow for higher capacity, probably two grams or even more. However, the actual bottleneck is now uh, the preparation of our colloidal molecules. So we need here further improvement uh, in upscaling our approach. And now let's have a closer look at the fractions that we received from zonal rotor centrifugation. So these are pure monomers, pure dimers, and pure trimers, and a fraction that is, that is essentially rich in particle tetramers. So 100% purity of tetrahedral clusters needs still further optimization in regard to tailoring density gradient profiles. So in order to allow you to evaluate the configurations on these electron micrographs, we had to dilute all these fractions. And so in, um, so a typical fraction would, li would look like this. This is a fraction of pure colloidal oxygen molecules, and we have them now in great quantities to build up superstructures. So far, we talked about rate zonal separation, where we sorted these colloidal molecules according to their sedimentation coefficient. But how about how about isopycenic separation? So, in our latest experiment, we probed a mixture of polystyrene particles, PMMA particles, and hybrids of the two materials. So you can see that we can bend them well according to their bion, den bion density, and we can use this technique even to precisely detect the density of this complex dumbbell-shaped hybrid particle. And even more, 
we get the density profile by conventional methods uh, um, averaging. So back to Alexander. So thank you, Simona, also for letting us know about large-scale separations uh, carried out in a zonal rotor. Now, let me briefly summarize. So we started today's journey with the preparation of colloidal molecules, uh, starting with the assembly of nanoparticles, which is moderated by emulsion droplets. And I hope that we could convince you that one can even prepare well-defined colloidal supraparticles uh, from nanoparticles. However, the fact that we get a mixture of different species um, is where centrifugation entered the scene. And there you should remember that there are two basic ways of how to perform density gradient centrifugations. The first one is rate zonal separations, where particles are classified according to their sedimentation coefficient, which depends on both size and density. Now, this technique is very versatile, and it can be applied almost to all types of nanoparticles. So nanoparticles that have distributions, either in size or density or both. The other alternative technique is classification according to the buoyant density. So this technique is termed isopysnic centrifugation, and this can be applied to composite particles, such as core shell particles or other hybrid particles. Now, buoyant density centrifugation offers extraordinary resolutions because particles can be well bended according to their density. Then we started with discussion of yeah, centrifugations, density gradient centrifugation at small scales. And here, swing out rotors provide an excellent uh, solution. So they offer perf almost perfect sorting efficiencies. So you could see here that the different zones of, let's say, up to 12 different particle populations shown in this uh, centrifuge tubes can be bended in well-defined discrete zones. However, if you require larger, vol uh, larger amounts, so let's say if you want to go towards the multiple gram scale, then we would like highly recommend you, so looking into zonal rotor centrifugation, where hollow bowl-shaped rotor replace the need of having centrifuge tubes. And this allows for large-scale fractionation of nanoparticles. Now, let me thank the people who did actually the work. So the colloidal molecules that we discussed today and all centrifugations uh, were carried out by Simone Plüsch. Owen Stuckert prepared the particles that we used for extending zonal rotor centrifugation towards isopysnic separations. He also studied the hydrodynamic properties of the colloidal molecules, which actually helped us a lot to remove these centrifugal fraction routines. Then uh, we would like to acknowledge a support from key uh, facilities of our university, namely the Particle Analysis Center. And here we would like to thank Brigitte Bösenecker, who helped us a lot during performing zonal rotor centrifugation. Then we enjoyed fruitful collaborations with many partners. And we would also like to acknowledge Lutz Erhardt from Beckmann Kulder, who encouraged us moving into this field of zonal rotor centrifugation. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for listening and watching. And now we are ready to accept your questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wittemann and Dr. Blüsch, for your informative presentation. Um, we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Our first question is a very exciting presentation. You, present, you presented separations that look just very good. Does it always look so good? How much experience is needed to get there? 
Yeah, so thanks for the question. So, well, we have now several years of experience in performing centrifug centrifugation. However, carrying out proper centrifugation is not a mystery. It's uh, predictable, so it's uh, pure physics. And actually, um, already the result of our first fractionation was more than we expected. So we had a uh, uh, banding of six different particle populations. And uh, after further refinements, we could extend this to up to 14 different populations. And uh, I think uh, having a clam hand and having the right equipment such, uh, such as a swing out rotor and proper recovery solutions help a lot. If I may add, so we recommend you um, to not to stick to protocols used by others that work out well for other types of nanoparticles. So it's better to design a gradient which perfectly uh, uh, fits your needs. And as Simona said, it's just basic physics. So you, there are just some uh, simple conditions that should be fulfilled. And then you can easily develop a strategy that really works out very well for your sets of nanoparticles. And nowadays, uh, simulation routines offered either by the manufacturer of your centrifuge or uh, which are uh, available by open source domains can help you finding proper separation routines. Okay, uh, next question is, <clears throat> you show different gradient separation techniques. Which of those techniques do you prefer? Separation by density or separation by size? Ah, okay, so we make this decision dependent on the actual separation tasks. We have, so for example, the different populations of our collagen molecules that we showed uh, have the same density, and for this reason, they can be separated only by rate zone separa uh, centrifugation, but not by isopysnic separation, for example. Yeah, maybe um, you should e even think about combining the two different strategies. So this could even improve further sorting quality. So for example, if you consider colloidal molecules, which are assembled from two different sets of particles, which differ in their density, in this specific case, it would be helpful to start with an isopysnic separation first then you have fractions that share the same density, and then you could do a rate zonal separation to sort them according to their size. So you should think about combination of the two strategy, and this is also something which is our, on our agenda. Great. The third question, did you compare those separations with chromatography, and how does that compare? Yeah, well, uh, chromatography, of course, uh, works very well for molecules and also for small nanoparticles. However, you should consider that nanoparticles can get stuck in the pores uh, of the stationary phase uh, of a, when you do chromatography. So moreover, the method is limited to small scales, let's say to the um, scales of a few milligrams. And uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I would like to add that beyond centrifugation and chromatography, there are other techniques, such for example, membrane filtration. Uh, they are also allow for nanoparticle separation. And however, we prefer centrifugation because uh, of the better resolution of the centrifugation and the sedimentation time of a particle exposed to a centrifugal field scales with the radius squared, and um, which provides a remarkable resolving power. And that's why we use um, the centrifugation techniques. Uh, next one is a very specific question. Um, anyone using for foot and mouth disease virus particles? I think maybe we can go a little more general because many people um, compare virus particles and nanoparticles. What would you say to that from a professional point of view? Yeah, so in the early days, uh, so if you talk about zonal rotor separation, uh, when it was established by Norman G. Anderson, so the idea was sorting uh, viruses. So you can, you can really uh, sort the whole range of biological species 
starting, let's say, from macromolecules like DNA, and then you can go up to whole cells. And this also includes uh, virus particles, so it works very well. So you have seen the pioneering experiment carried out by Myron Parker already in 1951, who exactly used this method for the purification of viruses. So these strategies that we showed you will work uh, very well also for viruses. Okay, so we'd have time for some more questions. Obviously, all the questions are already answered by the great presentation. Um, I want to remind our audience that those questions who were not asked or answered today and those um, that come in during the on-demand period, they will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration directly by Dr. Plüsch and Dr. Wittemann. So if there are no further questions so far, I want to thank you again, Dr. Wittemann and Dr. Plüsch. Do you happen to have any final comments for the audience? Yeah, we just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. So feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. We wish you best of luck when performing uh, your centrifugal separations. Goodbye. Goodbye. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience myself for joining us today and for the interesting questions. Questions we, we did not have time for or we have not been asked today and those who, submit, who will be submitted later, as I just mentioned, will be addressed by the speaker to a later time, point of view via email address. We would like to thank once again uh, Dr. Wittemann and Dr. Plüsch for their time today and for their important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, my company, Beckner Kulte Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share the email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's it. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>